Hello students, welcome to EPG Partshala. I am Dr. Aranya Bhattacharji from the School of Physical Sciences, Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. Today we are going to discuss about the module excitations, that is spin waves, from the paper solid state physics. So students, let us see what we are going to learn in this module. First thing, understand the concept of spin waves, which are also known as magnons. Learn about Holstein Primakov transformation to solve the spin Hamiltonian. So, this is a specific special technique, very really special transformation that you have to learn to solve spin Hamiltonians. Learn how to calculate the ground state of the spin Hamiltonian using semi classical approach. So, the first thing that you sh one should learn when you are given a Hamiltonian is to calculate the ground state. Then how the spin Hamiltonian is solved in the large spin limit to generate the spin wave dispersion. This is also one of the very prime results of uh, solving spin Hamiltonian that is to generate the spin wave dispersion. And then finally from the spin wave dispersion we will learn about what are the famous Goldstone modes. The ferromagnetic ground state of the Heisenberg Hamiltonian is maximally polarized that is L into S where L is the number of lattice sites but what does it mean that it is maximally polarized because why all the spins are pointing in the same direction that is why it is maximally polarized. Low lying excitations can be created by turning the J spin from Sjz to S to Sjz to S minus 1 and then allowing this deformation to propagate through the crystal like a plane wave. So try to understand this. So these excitations are spin wave. So you are basically disturbing one site and that is propagated. A quasi particle that is created when a spin wave is excited is called a Magnon. So, magnons are quantized magnetization density waves. So, this figure actually beautifully illustrates the spin waves in one direction. So, if you look at this figure carefully, you will see that what we had just said that you sort of create a disturbance in one lattice and you allow that to propagate. So, you see that if you look at the left side and you, then you can imagine that the spin, say, so assume that like all the spins are pointing up, let us say in you know, one direction, they are all pointing up. No, there is no spin wave excitation. Then you slightly tilt one of the spins, let us say in the extreme left. And then what you do is that you allow that tilt, but the angle by which it has been tilted to travel. So, it will travel throughout the lattice. So this is basically a one dimensional representation and you can see beautifully a sinusoidal kind of a curve is produced which is basically representing the spin wave. So, what exactly is the Holstein Primakov transformation? This can be done using now a Schrodinger representation. That is basically Schrodinger representation means that in this specific case where you are replacing the spins by bosonic operators. So, we will now wish to express the magnon creation and destruction operators in terms of the spin operators. In this new representation, the spins are represented by Bose operators. So, okay students, so now uh, we will try to understand what exactly is Holstein Primakov transformation. See, we now wish to express the magnon creation and destruction operators in terms of the spin operators. So, in the Heisenberg Hamiltonian, we had used product of fermion creation and annihilation operators, but now in this new representation, the spins are represented by Bose operators. Now, adopting the Schwinger representation, so let A1 dagger and A2 dagger be two boson creation operators. Okay. For each site, then we have three spin operators 
SJX, SJY and SJZ. So SJ basically represents the spin at the jth side and the components are included in the superscript X, Y and Z. And they are coupled to the identity. This identity is very important. SJX square plus SJY square plus SZ square is equal to S into S plus 1 where S is the total spin. Okay, so this last identity which I have just said is uh, very important and it will be used uh, throughout uh, this uh, module. Now we can write these spin operators or the spin components which we have described in terms of the bosonic operators A1 dagger, A1, A2 dagger and A2. Okay, so this is basically the aim that what I had already said. That, that I want to write, you know, rewrite these spins in terms of these bosonic operators. So, this is basically one of the es essence of the Holstein Pinokov transformation. So, this is very important. So, the uh, x component of the spin is written like this Sx is equal to half A1 dagger A2 plus A2 dagger A1. Also, you know, it's very uh, note also this thing, very important that you see the in Sx, the second part A2 dagger A1 is basically the Hermitian uh, conjugate of this A1 dagger A2, okay. So, as you can see that when we take this uh, Hermitian conjugate, the A2 operator which is appearing as a destruction on the first term now appears as a creation but it moves to the left of A1, okay. So, you have to take that into consideration. This is very important from the quantum mechanics point of view. And Sy is half of A2 dagger A1 minus A1 dagger A2 and also as z is half of a1 dagger a1 plus a2 dagger a2 so this is you know like a very important three relations that we have just studied now the spin operators obey the commutation relation for angular momentum operators okay so uh, what is basically the commutation relation for the angular momentum operators is applicable here so i write here one example that is the commutation of the spin component Sx and Sy is equal to iota by 4 A1 dagger A2 plus A2 dagger A1 comma A2 dagger A1 minus A1 dagger A2. The commutation of these two is gives me iota Sz. Okay. So, actually you can verify this also. This is very important. And at the same time, we also have the relations that is S plus which is basically an operator is equal to a1 dagger a2 and s minus operator is equal to a2 dagger a1. So, they are basically you know conjugate of each other notice that. Now, stepping the spin down by one step is like creating a boson. However, we cannot remember equate aj dagger with sj minus ok. Do not confuse with this. So, if one wants to describe particles of spin then the following relation should be satisfied. So, total spin S is equal to half A1 dagger A1 plus A2 dagger A2. Now, this equation will be satisfied only if A2 is equal to under root of 2S minus A1 dagger A1. Okay. And uh, also, S plus can be written as A1 dagger into under root of 2S minus A1 dagger A1. S minus is equal to under root of 2S minus A1 dagger A1 into A1. So, you see that why I am saying S plus and S minus are conjugate of each other, Hermitian conjugate. So, if you take the conjugate of S plus, you will immediately see that the term in under root does not change. But what changes is that A1 dagger becomes A1, but it goes to the right hand side of the under root. When it was existing in the case of S plus, on the left hand side okay you have to be very careful these are small things but they matter a lot and at the same time you have sz is equal to a1 dagger a1 minus s and the standard spin commutation relation commutation between s plus and s negative is equal to twice of sz is always satisfied now in order to express the z component of the spin that is sz as a1 dagger and a1, we can write sz square 
is equal to s into s plus 1 minus half of s plus into s minus plus s minus into s plus. Now, we already have these relations for s plus and s minus which we have already defined. So, you can substitute them here and by substituting this, we get this expression that is s z square is equal to s into s plus 1 minus s a whole bracket you have this quantity that a1 dagger into 1 minus a1 dagger a1 divided by 2s multiplied by a1 plus under root of brackets 1 minus a1 dagger a1 divided by 2s multiplied by a1 into a1 dagger again multiplied by in brackets 1 minus a1 dagger a1 divided by 2s so you can sort of you know like uh, have a look at this expression and then immediately you get to see that how you can sort of simplify this and after simplification you can see that this reduces to s z whole square is equal to s minus a1 dagger a1 whole square and then taking the under root of both sides you will see that s z finally is equal to s minus a1 dagger a1. So, with this uh, equation for S z, we can conclude that the number of bosons is equal to the number of times the spin has been stepped down. So, each time you step down the, the spin, you create a boson. Okay, see, you see the connection between the two. Now, let us talk about the ground state energy and what we mean by Goldstone modes. So, we already are familiar from our previous three, four slides about the Holstein Primakov transformation. And then, you know, like uh, we have already said that, like we want to write the spins in terms of the bosonic modes. So, now let us now go back to the Heisenberg Hamiltonian. We now proceed to solve the Heisenberg Hamiltonian by assuming that this S, total S, the spin, to be very large. We are assuming a very large spin and expanding in 1 by S. Okay. So, I say that S is large, but expanding in 1 by S. So, S large means 1 by S is small. Okay. So, Try to note this important point. So, the dot product of two different spins, uh, two different sites, let us say, ith side and jth side, si dot sj is equal to half of si plus into sj negative plus sj plus into si negative plus sij into sjz. Okay. So, this is standard, you know, quantum mechanics from textbook, you can see this. But this is a standard result and then you know uh, putting in the values uh, expressions for s plus and s minus from our previous slides uh, you get to see this is an expression that i get for the si dot sj well i mean like it's a long expression but very useful one actually now we use the semi classical approximation taking s to be large okay so we are only you know working in this limit of large s so large spin we talk about in this limit the operator ai becomes ai is equal to under root of s into bi plus ai minus under root of s bi what we have done here is we have added under root of s into bi and subtracted under root of s into bi where bi is a constant which is determined by minimizing the hamiltonian okay the hamiltonian that I written down earlier so substituting the expression for ai that we have written down in terms of bi into the hamiltonian we and expanding in 1 by s okay so remember that you know it's very important s large we are expanding in 1 by s so to leading orders the hamiltonian is written like this so, you see here uh, h is equal to minus summation over j i j into this expression which is there inside this square brackets which contains all the constant b i and b j. Now, the next thing that we need to do is to find the ground state. Okay, this is usually we do that for any Hamiltonian that we first thing that we do is to find the ground state. For that, uh, we will make some approximations so that we can tackle this complex Hamiltonian easily. Assume that all j i j are positive, this constant. Further assume only nearest neighbor interactions and all these constants i j are j i j are same 
j. So, we replace all these j i j as simply j. So, everything I mean irrespective of which site it is, what are the nearest neighbors, everything is the same. Also, all the b i are same. So, that is basically we are assuming you know like uh, really a homogeneous and system where everything is same. So, what we do is that the ground state then can now be found like this. The expression that is shown here E naught. E naught is equal to minus J L Z S square multiplied by in square brackets mod of B square into 2 minus mod of B square plus 1 minus mod of B square whole square. And I can see from here that all these indices are gone I and J. So, irrespective of where we are, everything is the same which is equal to minus j l z s square. Here z is the coordination number of each lattice site and l is the total number of lattice sites. Okay. So, the ground state is independent of b because the spins can rotate in any direction so long as they are all point together. Okay. Very important. It is independent of b. Why? Because the spins can rotate in any direction so long as they are point together. Now, what we do is that once we have calculated the ground state, we now include the next higher order in the Hamiltonian by treating the operator A as small. Okay. So, we go one order higher. So, in the previous case, we were able to calculate the ground state, but now we go a higher order. So, the Hamiltonian H is approximately equal to minus l j z s square minus this term which contains these operators minus 2 j summation over this triangular bracket actually indicates that they are the nearest neighbors. If you remove this then it means that you are taking into account all neighbors first next nearest neighbors and so on. But when you have this then basically that implies that it is the ne next nearest neighbors only multiplied by uh, so this is summation over s uh, in the brackets you have this term where you have all these uh, a i n ages. A factor of 2 appears because each pair appears twice. Okay, Important factor of 2 appears because each pair appears twice and in this Hamiltonian the first part if you look at it, it is a ground state. This, so, the first part of the Hamiltonian is a ground state which we have already calculated. Okay, Now, we go beyond. So, ground state and the next now we are doing it. Now, remember that in the previous Hamiltonian which we had described, we had only retained terms which are quadratic in these A's, okay, not cubic and the fourth power. So, we are happy with the quadratic because that is the next higher order. Now, the Hamiltonian can be diagonalized by the following operator which represents propagating excitations. So, in any case, you know, like if you are given a Hamiltonian, then you need to diagonalize it to find the eigenvalues. And the trick here is that it is a propagating excitation and naturally the propagating excitation can be written like this a i is equal to 1 by under root of L summation over k a k e raised to power minus iota k dot r i. So, this is basically something like a normalized representation where you get to see this under root of L in the denominator and the summation is over all the modes the k vectors that is the k that we see here. So, this yields the following Hamiltonian. Okay. So, once you so basically you know like you substitute back uh, into this Hamiltonian earlier Hamiltonian which we had described containing all these a i and a j s and you get h is equal to minus l j z s square plus summation over k h cross omega k n k where n k is a k dagger a k okay. and the frequency omega h cross omega is 2 s j summation over this small delta vector 1 minus cos of delta dot k, where delta is the difference in the coordinates between the two points r i minus r j. So, the frequency that we have written down in the earlier slide is basically what is called as the spin wave dispersion relation. Fine, I mean, like we write down, you can plot also the frequency versus k. But what is important here is to note that what is the value. And how does it behave this dispersion at low energies? The low energy is, you know, like see, you have to differentiate between low energy and high energy. So, we are very much interested in this low energy behavior. So, for low energy, 
magnons. The frequency can be rewritten approximately as h cross omega is equal to sj summation over delta delta square k square. So look at this expression. This is a quadratic dispersion for specifically only for this low energy. And also note that as mod of k goes to zero, omega k goes to zero. These are known as the famous Goldstone modes. Okay. Goldstone modes have a peculiar behavior that as k goes to zero, omega k goes to zero. So you see that you know what Goldstone modes are now that it is basically the low energy excitations of this coming from the dispersion of the spin waves. Now this figure also beautifully illustrates the concept of Goldstone modes. So on the top figure you will see that you have all the spins pointing up. Okay. And then on the right hand side as you go you tilt the spins all three of them by a same angle. Okay. So what is this happening? Zero wave number. Okay. Earlier they were pointing up, now they are pointing in a different direction, but they are all in the same direction. Either you talk about the left one or the right one. So the energy cost is zero. There is no energy cost here in this case. Now if you go to the bottom, again on the left hand side you have all the spins up, but when you take it to the right, you will see that all the spins are not tilted in the same angle. So, for example, the first spin is still pointing up, the second spin is slightly tilted to the right, and the third spin is slightly more tilted towards the right. Okay, so you get a small wave number. That is the wave number of the sum total on the right hand side is not the same as here. Okay, there is a difference. So, this costs energy, the small wave number, and that is exactly the Goldstone mode. So, students, what you have studied here in this module is the concept of spin waves. So, magnons are quantized magnetization density wave. Then we also have studied how to use the holstein primakov transformation to solve the spin Hamiltonian in which spins are represented by bosonic operators. The spin Hamiltonian is solved in the large spin limit. The large spin is very important because when we were solving it, we were expanding in 1 by s okay, to generate the spin wave dispersion relation and from the spin wave dispersion relation, you could then sort of go and find the Goldstone mode. So, thanks for visiting e Thank you very much.